please enjoy the presentation. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> I have to um, introduce me. Yeah, yeah you're right. Um, that's Andreas Eriksson, and uh, he will inform us about Nagios 5.1. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, 4.1 and um, 5. Something like that, yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I finished this presentation about two minutes ago, so uh, it's well rehearsed and uh, I have everything committed to memory. Um, <clears throat> there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, but if you're wondering about anything, just raise your hand and I'm sure the friendly microphone guy will come with you, come to you and uh, get you a microphone so everything can be caught on tape and things like that. So, I'll be talking about the future of Nagios. And I have no idea why that slide one thing is there, but... Uh, just... There we go. Um, here's the agenda about me, about OP5. Uh, they pay for my travels and things, so they get one of those sponsor stickers. That's the second slide. Uh, we have a slight look at the timeline, then we're going to see what happened. and. Uh, Short, short view in the rear view mirror, and then we're going to look to the future, because that's where the fun happens. Um, about me, I turn 34 next week. Uh, if anyone wants to congratulate me or buy me a birthday present, I will accept Jägermeister uh, at the evening event tonight. I've been programming since I was about seven, so I've been at it for quite some time now. Uh, I work as a core architect at OP5, which means that I decide how we should build systems so that they can scale out and so that other programs can plug into them. Uh, I've been a Nagios core developer 2009 to 2013. Uh, I'm a performance fanatic and I'm the author of Merlin and Nagios 4. It's actually not entirely true. I wrote 95% of the code that went into Nagios 4, but not 100%. Not Hello. <laughs> I'm getting the thumbs up from the staff here, it's awesome. Um, so this is the sponsor slide, um, uh, OP5, founded in 2003. We have 900-ish customers with a 97% renewal rate in our contracts. Uh, the ones that don't renew are usually companies that go bankrupt or get bought up by another company. Sometimes even our customers buy each other, that's quite funny. Um, we focus on mainly on large installations. If you have ever dabbled with Merlin, uh, you will know that it's used for uh, high availability, redundancy, and load distribution that you really only need in... Well, it's nice to have in all networks, but you really, really need them for the large ones. And uh, if you've looked at Nagios 4, you will know that it's mostly about performance. Um, it's really not that many new features in Nagios 4, but it performs so much better than Nagios 3. Um, I'm sure you can find all sorts of information at op5.com, uh, our website. <coughs> <coughs> the timeline. This is going to spark some questions, I think. Um, Nagios project started in 1999, uh, actually the 28th of January, according to some code comments that I found today. Um, in 2007, we had a conference in, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, I think you were there, weren't you? Yeah, Bernd was there. We, uh, and Ethan claimed that Nagios is feature complete. It's done now. He's not going to work on it anymore because, well, it's so awesome that you don't have to, you don't have to fiddle with it anymore. Uh, the community disagreed, sort of. So in 2009, we saw the first fork. Uh, that was Sichinga, uh, which uh, is run by the, uh, well, mostly by Netways, who are hosting this conference. This very nice conference. In 2012, Nagios 4 uh, was ready for release. Oh, another important thing. In 2009, um, Ethan, the founding father of Nagios, he brought on new core developers. <coughs> In 2012, Nagios 4 was ready for release. Uh, we laid down the plans for them at a conference in Italy, I think, and I started. I worked my ass off in 2011 to get everything done, uh, and 2012 for the for the conference. Then, 2013. This is where 
everything went to shit, basically. Uh, Nagios 4 finally got released about a year after it was done, uh, but the mailing list have been shut down and everything has been moved to uh, Nagios Enterprises moderated forums. Core developers have been removed. Actually, that's not entirely true because Ton Voon, one of the other core developers, he got removed in 2010 or 2011, uh, I think, when uh, uh, the company he worked for, which was then Altinity, used the fact that he was a core developer in their marketing material. That's apparently not good. So development has sort of stopped again, and Nagios Enterprises has issued a star hunt, uh, which, where they are looking for the next Nagios core developer. I know that Michael Medin, uh, sitting right here, he sent them an email and said, yeah, that could be fun. I'm interested. That was a month ago, something like that. Yeah. No reply so far, but it could be the next Nagio star who's sitting right there. So <coughs> I've actually decided to fork Nagios in 2013, uh, and the project name is Nimon so far. <coughs> I always like anagrams. So Nimon means networks, applications, and event monitor. Uh, you pronounce it just like demon. Uh, I created it last week. So Everything is very much not finished yet, uh, especially since I was attending a bachelor party last week and then a wedding this weekend, so uh, not, not much is done at all, really. Um, <coughs> so far, it's mostly me, but I was discussing this with a couple of developers over at the Nagios, Confer Nagios World Conference four weeks ago. Uh, Michael Medin was one of them, and it had some basic... Yeah, you should do that. I will rather join forces with you than with the Nagios team. And uh, <coughs> we do have 98% of the Nagios core development effort in the project already. Although that's not so hard since I represent 95% of it. So one other guy makes for the other three. Um, the focus here is performance, modularity, extendability, maintainability, and openness. Uh, it looks like a marketing team has written this, uh, but it's not. That's not the case, actually. I just had to find words that made it, that made the text fit, so that you could also see the logo because it looks ugly otherwise. Um, openness is in bold here because I really dislike when things move to moderated forums, when things go to. <sighs> when you have a company in control of something, uh, I don't like that at all. And actually, I stand the risk of getting fired because I created this fork. But it was, it was needed. Um, why fork? Well, open source projects should be open. Everything about them should be open. Uh, people who want to join in should be invited to join in. If they suck, they should be told that they suck, politely. Uh, and they should be taught to not suck. Also, political bullshit really has no place in technical projects. Um, I was most likely kicked for political reasons. So it, you just don't, you can't run a project like that. If you have a really good developer, you can't just fire him because, he's, because he does good things. It doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, and I also disagree very, very strongly with marketing department dictati dictating roadmaps and release dates. Uh, Nagios 4 was ready for release at least December last year, but since Nagios Enterprises had, well, they just shipped out a release based on Nagios 3, they couldn't really have the open source version, the free open source version outperforming their paid version, so they held off on the release for almost a year that's that's just bullshit. You, that's not how a project is supposed to work. <clears throat> Why I got kicked from the project? Um, well, the official reason is that I shipped in on the development branch of Nagios. I sent in a commit that fixed so you can't have downtime going into negative numbers, which means that the next downtime won't actually register as a downtime, so you'll still get notifications. Uh, I wrote a bad commit, which that change it fixed an actual bug, but it also made it so that the CGI, the user interface, didn't build anymore. 
Uh, Ethan claimed that I did that on purpose to sabotage the release. He also claimed that OP5 has used the fact that I wrote most of Nagios 4 in their marketing material. Since that's actually true, which is unusual for marketing, um, I don't really see the point here. And it's also a bit contradictory because if we want to use that as a fact, then we would get more benefit out of that, out of making the Nagios release really, really awesome. So um, one bad commit out of 973 that I counted uh, from Git logs. Uh, the real reason is most likely that I was becoming known as the Nagios developer. No one else was doing very much with Nagios. I, I did lots of it. And it's pretty bad for Nagios enterprises to have someone outside their company being known as the developer. They could do it in a good way. They could say, hey, this project is so awesome that even our competitors are paying people to work on it. But he chose to see it a different way. So the real reason I was kicked is most likely that, well, uh, Nayo's development was strongly associated with me. And they couldn't really handle that. Anyways, brief look back. Nagios 4, uh, we focused on uh, foundations. We did a lot of work with performance. If you've tried Nagios 4, uh, especially if you have uh, notification scripts that run for a long time or use uh, event handlers and things like that, you will know that in Nagios 3, you could get really, really high latency. That was because a lot of things weren't parallelized in Nagios 3. Uh, they were serial, so if you had we had one user who, <coughs> who sent me an email and said that, yeah, every time we notify things, go, things our latency just skyrockets. Uh, they had a notification script that called 12 people in serial. A, uh, the call took about a minute, and they said they had asterisk calling people and saying, like, yeah, the service, blah, 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 on host, blah, 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 is critical. Would you like to acknowledge? And you could, you could have, like, a menu phone thing. And... So, yeah, calling 12 people, one minute, they got a latency of about 15 minutes after that. It's useless. So, <coughs> took all that shit away. Performance and stability, we added a lot of auto-testing, and we built a small, well, I built a small library, uh, which you can reuse to build new workers, to build new functionality uh, on top of, top of Nagios. <coughs> the only two real features uh, or the query handler and the, the nerd radio. Uh, the nerd is Nagios event radio dispatcher, or now the Neiman event radio dispatcher. Very nifty to have an N at the start of the name, really. Um, <coughs> the query handler um, is built with it's an input handler plus a brief API. You query it by saying, hey, I want to talk to this part of the system, you add a space, and then you write your query. Some queries, some addresses don't really understand queries at all. Uh, but hey, it works. There are a few built-in handlers like echo, help, core, w, proc, and nerd. Uh, so nerd is actually addressed through the query handler. Um, <coughs> This is something that you can build further on. If you, if you write event broker modules, for instance, you can add, you can add new handlers so, so you can query them in the same way. And there's a help, uh, the help thing here means that we document everything directly in the code. You can ask for, hey, list the available handlers and you get a list of them with a short description, what they do and what they, well, what you can accomplish with them. Nerd. <coughs> Nagios Event Radio Dispatcher. It provides real-time data to add-ons outside of Nagios Core. It used to be that real-time data was something that you could only access with event broker modules. Uh, you had to have an event broker module. And that's kind of... It, that kind of sucks, to be honest. Uh, because event broker modules have to be written in C. If you fuck them up, you will crash Nagios completely. Your monitoring will stop. You will get a nice core dump that you can do whatever you want to with. Um, and that fact means that of all the add-ons that, that exist in the Nagios world, most of them are plugins. A plugin is a sort of add-on. 
there are like five or six hundred of those at least, probably in the thousands. You can write them in any language you want, and if you if you do them wrong, things really it won't really matter for the rest of the monitoring system. But with event broker modules, that's not the case. So uh, I think there are about four or five uh, event broker modules that are actually used, and that's in a project that has 14 or 15,000 downloads every week. That's it, it's very nifty, but y you can do much more if you can ship the data outside of Nagios. Um, it can also reduce the I.O. load of current add-ons, where you don't have to dump things to file. You can just listen to it and say, hey, feed me this as it comes in. Uh, you query it as nerd via the query handler. There are a couple of example queries here. You just subscribe or unsubscribe to different radio stations. Uh, and you can already do pretty cool things with it, such as this, for instance. Oh, no, I don't have plugins, so... Ta-da! Um, this is a program called GORS, which basically, it's originally meant to uh, to illustrate how source code development works over time. So, But in this case, these are Nagios workers, actually Nemon workers, because this is from the Nemon core. And every light, every laser beam you see shooting out is a check result getting reaped uh, that comes in from them. And this is the network that uh, actually one OP5 customer uses. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it would be horrible to try to build that inside, uh, inside Nemon or Nagios or inside a running system, but once you get the data out of it, you can easily generate videos like that. So that's pretty cool. So, the future, Nemon roadmap. <coughs> uh, there will be a slide about each and every one of these, so I'm just going to skip this one. I'm lazy like that. External commands via query handler. Uh, commands get sent via the query handler as key value vector things. Key value vector is a, it's a part of the part of the library that you can use to, to ship things in. It's really, really simple. You just send basically comma-separated lists, uh, or, well, a character-separated list of something, something equals something, something. Um, why is that a good idea? Well, we get proper error reporting, for instance. Right now, if you ship in an external command via the command pipe, that's a one-way communication, so you get no idea whatsoever if the command was successful, if you uh, had a typo in your host name or whatever, it just doesn't work. Um, it also becomes easier to maintain, test and document, since we can have the two-way communication. You can ask which commands are available, uh, which, which parameters do they take, and <coughs> since we need to know that anyway, just documenting it so we can feed it out to the user becomes really, really simple. It also means that we can support certain variables for all commands, like username, who sent this command, who disabled the checks for all our hosts. Uh, that's pretty nifty. And you can send trigger time, so you can schedule something to happen in the future, and it would be as if that command had been received in the future. It won't work with the past, but... Sorry. <coughs> um, drop dear support. Um, well, uh, writing a simple library and a minor rewrite of config parsing routines is quite simple. Then you can have, so you just drop down, drop a file in a directory and Nagios will pick it up. Uh, this already works for, uh, well, Nemon picks it up. This actually already works for object configuration, where you can have the cfg underscore dir statement. But it's nifty to also have it for like event broker modules or uh, add-ons like like PNP that requires a lot of uh, that requires a lot of configuration from the for the main configuration file. Uh, currently, you have to do that by in you when you install it, you either have to edit the file in place uh, or have to append to it. It makes it really horrible to try to maintain uh, maintain add-ons as packages because you have to take care of, has it been installed before? Is something else installed as well? Should it, it's, well. <coughs> and mass management becomes a lot easier, of course. 
Um, runtime modifiable main config. This is something that comes more or less for free with the, with the drop tier support. So the minor rewrite of the config parsing routines means that you can send a query to the query handler where you enable certain debug options without having to restart. Uh, it's quite nifty. It won't work with, it, with all variables, such as you can't, for instance, change the location of the query handler socket uh, through the query handler socket. That would be a little bit weird, and it would require a bit of reinitialization. Re but uh, for a lot of variables, that would work just fine. Um, it's also it's more generic than adding external commands to disable or enable host or service checks or tweaking some parameter. So you just yeah okay, we, you can alter this configuration parameter, and if it affects the runtime anyway at all, yeah we get it. Or we already build it when we add the configuration parameter. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Scheduler controlled helpers. This is actually this is one of those boring features uh, that is actually pretty major in terms of what you can build with it. Um, so, we, when I was talking about the nerd radio, I said that you can use it to to reduce the load, I/O load, for instance, of current add-ons that currently use spool files or something like that. Uh, they should be able to subscribe to just the correct channel and get all the data they need. But there is a problem here that they might miss events that come when uh, Neiman starts running, and that's not so good. So if you miss like the ten first events, there could be notifications or whatever. Uh, you're gonna be shooting blindly, or you have to solve it by parsing log files or doing something else. <coughs> so that's not so good. So uh, with scheduler control helper demons, we uh, you can you can make sure that a helper program like PNP, for instance, is started before we start running events. Uh, that means that it, we can make sure that it doesn't miss any events at all. Uh, that means that you can put status data into a database with a Python script that just listens to the proper channel. We also get uh, we also get a single system start and stop because we can stop all the helpers when we shut down, and we can start them again when we start up. It's really simple. We get built-in keep alive for all of, all of them, and it becomes absolutely trivial to write new ones because they can run as foreground programs. Uh, you can debug them and then have, uh, then have Neiman control them once you're done. Check result transformer. This is actually spawned by, the, this is an idea that came up with Anders Hall. Is he here? Ah, there he is. Yeah, uh, he's going to give a presentation tomorrow about something called BizCheck, which is a pretty awesome project where you can have dynamic thresholds that, uh, well, for instance, if you have a large data center, you would want to know if one of your server, or if five servers maybe out of the 100,000, are using 100% CPU while the others are using 20%, because that means there's some problem there. The load isn't shared or distributed as it should be. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you can do with this check. You look at the average of all others, so you can see how much, uh, what was the disk usage last week? Has it grown too much over the last 24 hours, or things like that? So. <clears throat> How this is going to work is that external helper connects to the nerd channel where they can get check results. Uh, the events just zip off to the helper. Helpers can uh, alter the state or performance data or whatever, and the helper then zaps the result back via the query handler. Um, it's really, it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, when I talk about this here, I do it in the form of the core support that's needed to write the external helper and make sure that that one works. So I'm not going to do that. I'll probably hook it up with BizCheck instead, uh, which is much smarter. <laughs> Object extensions. Object extensions are nifty if you have things like Nagvis uh, that want to add coordinates to to uh, hosts or services or whatever and put them on a map somewhere. Uh, you can load them from special configuration files. Modules can request extensions to be read. 
And extension objects are sent to loaded modules. So when we read something new, we send it to the loaded modules. It avoids the linear lookup time of, of configured variables. So you can, for instance, have you can teach live status how to feed Nagvis data for its. So you get all the filtering and all the selection things that uh, that live status has. But you can feed it extension variables, and you can do configuration in a format that is shareable uh, and predefined without having to invent your own stuff or having to write in the object configuration files. So that's pretty that's pretty nifty. Dynamic object creation. Well, um, this is mostly for very large, uh, very large networks as well, or when you have, uh, when you spin up a lot of virtual servers during business hours, for instance, you will want them to be created, at automatically. So, you can, if you can create, uh, create hosts and services via the query handler, just make the right query, send all the parameters you want, clone a host or do something like that. Um, you don't have to restart or reload or anything like that. Things will just pop up and they will start being monitored. Um, <coughs> it will be implemented like with a housekeeping event because this will modify the in-core memory that m that event broker modules use. So they will have to look at the they will have to look at the housekeeping events and stop what they're doing for a brief period of time uh, until the housekeeping stuff is done. So when you add, when you send the query to, hey, start monitoring this, um, it will start monitoring that after maybe five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever you configure it to. Um, well, the why is pretty simple. New stuff can just call in and monitoring starts uh, and monitoring shouldn't stop. It's one of those ITIL requirements, I think. It's pretty nifty, though. Live status. Well, live status is the only sensible ways, only sensible way of getting status data out of uh, out of Nagios or anything Nagios like. Uh, everything else just sucks. If you have a large network and you stuff things into a database, a stat status data, you will do. A several hundred writes per second that no one cares about because humans won't refresh the web browser often enough or you won't be scraping the information to uh, to anything else fast enough for all those updates to be actually useful. So, um, well, building it in right into the core or actually, well, shipping it as a default way is uh, is the only sensible way of doing things. Um, it also benefits the entire community to have a to have a single shared way of getting your information. Um, Live status built by Matthias Kettner. Thank you very very much. Uh, it's one of the greatest inventions I've seen in this community. Really, right. All the features that I've been talking about are on the installment plan, but all will be completed by next year. So if I'm invited back to this conference next year, I will be able to show you uh, demos and things like that. Um, this is the GitHub account for the Nemon project. Um, I actually registered that when I was on my way to the bachelor party, so it's completely empty for now. Sorry about that. <coughs> um, other things that I've been talking about can be found at git, uh, git.op5.org, uh, where we host our where OP5 hosts their public repositories. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask but don't really think of until after the conference, you can just email me, agaric79 at gmail.com, or I'm going to amend this slide, actually. There we go. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah.
Well, uh, Andreas, um, before you answer, yeah, um, can you I repeat the question for a comment? Yeah, um, the question was, uh, will I go my own way or will I stick to what Nagios does? I think, is that uh, more or less correct? Um, considering the, the amount of innovation in Nagios uh, since, well, 2007, uh, 2007 was a good year, that's when Nagios got event broker, module support and th stuff like that. Uh, since then, nothing has happened. Sticking with Nagios development right now will probably mean that I won't be doing anything at all uh, for a couple of years. So no, I won't be sticking to what Nagios does, if what Nagios does is nothing. If they do awesome stuff, yeah, sure, then I will stick to that. Uh, if it turns out that the Nagios project picks up and, and does amazing things, I see no reason to let Neiman actually keep on living. But history has proven that they don't, they won't, it, it will just stop. They're looking for th this star hunt that they started, uh, where they're looking for the next Nagios core developers. They're basically, they have a wish list for that person that would mean that they will have to go headhunting Google's brightest engineers and they want them to sit down and work for free on Nagios, a project which they are probably not familiar with because all the very good programmers in the Nagios community are most likely in this room, actually. Uh, it, th there aren't that many. Um, so I doubt that Nagios will have a really shiny, uh, really shiny future. I hope that Neiman will. I will try to make it so. So uh, I won't be sticking to what Nagios does if what they do is nothing. But I will evaluate it based on technical merit and see if they do good, good things. I will take that. More questions? <coughs> yeah, it's a large room, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So your source code has been removed from the Nagios uh, development or? No, they keep my source code, but they removed me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that was not part of the deal, I think. <laughs> no, it wasn't really a part of the deal. But well, th it's like that when you work on open source projects. I mean, uh, you, you work for the project, then it's, it, was, it was a bit of a dick move that I got removed, but uh, I wouldn't want my code to be removed because the code is actually still a sort of legacy and people who look at it, I mean, if you look at the, see now, no. uh, no, 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 no. oh well, you can do like this. If you look at the at the git log, you can get a that was a dumb window to do it in. You can see that the <coughs> where the commit history comes from here. This is actually a slightly older version that I'm using, but uh I would still want that. Uh, everyone who looks at that will see that uh, will see who's doing who is doing and has been doing the work. So I wouldn't want my code to be removed. That would be stupid. We will go back to the dark ages with Nagios 3.5 or something. I think the reason they scrapped you is you were 30 commits from, from having more commits than, than Ethan, actually. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> going for the throne! <laughs> I was so close to 1,000 as well. Oh, shit. Yeah, it could be that. Any more questions? But do you plan to stay compatible to the Nagios config file syntax? Because that's important if sometime later the project should die again, if Nagios happens to come up with, with good new ideas. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Um, the, uh, the configuration reading code is pretty horrible, actually. Uh, the, the very freestyle configuration syntax means that it's it's an awesome amount of work to try and support it, which means that I will probably take the lazy way out and uh, not do any changes. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we're, um, 
I actually had a slide that I accidentally deleted four minutes before the presentation. I couldn't get it back. But there are uh, there are integration points, we call them, uh, for for uh, well, Isinga and Nagios and Nemon as well, which is the configuration files go in. They are in data, and the uh, then you have the ways to extract data. That would be live status, the status retention, f the status data file, and the object cache file, and things like that. Uh, you also have the query handler and uh, the nerd radio thing, and those are not those are not won't change. Uh, it's more than likely that some event broker modules may have to be modified slightly, but uh, I know I sat with the Sven Nierlein last year uh, before the Nagios World Conference, and we did a rewrite. We modified Mod Gearman and uh, Live Status to make it work with Nagios 4. It was not an it was not an, uh, a lot of work really. Uh, we managed to get through it with only two bottles of rum, I think. So. Yeah, in one evening. So it will be a little bit of work, but not that much. It will be mostly compatible. All the plugins and things will keep on working. Uh, so the question was, would it be possible to just start with empty configuration and paste all the objects into the uh, into into Neiman? Yes, that would work. Uh, so if you want to write, that's, that's that's sort of what I have in mind is that you should be able to do things like that. So if you have a good CMDB system where you just pull everything out, you shouldn't have to dump that down to configuration files. You can if you want to, and if you have that solution already, then fine. But Creating everything dynamically from that com from that other database should work just fine as well. Uh. So why not joining the Isinga team? Because I think that I, uh, what I see is the, that the Isinga core is not. I'm pretty much pretty sure that it's not so many differences between the Isinga core and the Na the old Nagios core. So maybe it, it would be a good idea to have a Neiman core into the Isinga. Project because I think the the, the uh, web GUI for example for for my singers is uh, is very good. Um, that could be one way of doing it. There are sorry, Bernd, I'm gonna bash you a little bit now. Um, yeah. No, oh, I don't know what's gonna happen later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well. Um, what was the question? Wh why don't I join Isinga? So, yes, right. Okay, uh, Isinga, Isinga builds mainly on IDO utils. Uh, it's one of the core components of Isinga. Um, I disagree with that because you waste a lot of effort putting things into a database when you should be using live status instead. Uh, since there is a core disagreement on, on technical solutions to use there, which may not exist, may or may not exist. I, I, uh, I shouldn't really make projects when I'm drunk or on my way to a bachelor party, but, but sue me. <coughs> um, but no, I would not like to... I don't really want to join another project again, because while I'm... I, while I'm pretty tough-skinned, it kind of sucked to get kicked out after doing a lot of work. I wouldn't want that to happen again. <laughs> Why isn't this working? Ah, screw it. I don't have any more interesting slides anyway. Oh, there we go. Excellent. So, uh, no. Um, I would like to continue with the with the Nagios code and work on that. And I think that you, uh, Isinga project, decided to rewrite uh, Isinga core in C++. I don't speak C++, so that means I'm out. Well, I do, but I don't talk about it. Yeah, I don't. I do, but I don't want to. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you are young, and and you. You you can learn it. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. I can learn to like it. You mean no? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, further questions? <coughs> oh.
All right. In that case, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> okay, oh, um, that's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> awesome! <laughs>